Yo, what's up guys, it's Raddy here. I'm talking to Joa Kim today, one of Shifu's oldest students. He's been there for many years. He's been through a lot of, uh, you know, from the beginning to the end so far. Uh, Joe, it's a pleasure to have you on here. Give us a little bit of your background and where you're coming from. Yeah, well, I'm happy to be here. Um, my name is uh, Joa Kim, I'm from Norway. At the academy, they just called me Joe. So if you go there and they talk about Joe, yeah, that's me. I stayed at the school from 2013 and I left this year, 2018. So from what I was 16 until I was 21. <clears throat> I, um, yeah, before, before I went to China, I did practice other martial arts within, yeah, both Eastern, like Eastern martial arts, like Asian, Asian martial arts, like karate and a little bit of Taekwondo. Um, I did some Muay Thai actually, and I also did Kung Fu in the United States. Uh, it's called Modern Kung Fu. It actually comes from Jeet Kundo, so it's very similar to that. But I never did Shaolin Kung Fu before I came to China. And um, yeah, okay. A little bit of my background, anyway. Huh? So you've been training with Shifu since before he was at this new school, or you kind of came right when you went to the new school? Well, yeah, the thing was that when I first came to China, I trained in another school that's further south that Shifu used to teach at. And at that time, I didn't train with Shifu. I trained with another, with another master. Like, this school had many masters. But I, like, I saw like how he taught people, and like I talked to some of his students, and I was like, well, I'm definitely going to go train with this guy. So I went back to Norway, and when I came back, I was going to go back and train with this guy, like Shifu. But then I heard that he had opened a new school somewhere else. So then I came to his school when it had been opened in this particular location for two months. Okay. Yeah, I've heard stories about other students um, training in that old school, seeing how Shifu trained way more traditional than some of the other monks or uh, warriors. So that's something I've heard a lot too from other students. Yeah, he was by far the best in that school. I didn't even train with him, but I still saw like, wow, I'm definitely going to train with this guy. Yeah. Do you know uh, Shifu was a kickbox champion in China? Do you know the exact thing? I don't really, I'm not 100%. No, um, I, yeah, he was the champion. Yeah, a Sanda uh, champion, Chinese kickboxing champion. Because um, the thing with him, like many of the masters you'll encounter in China, have done, for example, only one of these big wushu schools. Some of them have been at the actual temple. Um, he did train at the actual temple for about four or five years. And then afterwards, he went and did a, a Sanda school. So only Sanda for about four years, I think. Okay. So he, he's done both. So that's why it's so good when it comes to fighting and kickboxing. He really knows his stuff. And the combination of the traditional Shaolin and, and the kickboxing is just perfect. Yeah, he's definitely very applications and not just the fancy wushu flipping stuff. Definitely. He's, he's very traditional in that sense that you really get the traditional traditional kung fu like it's supposed to be. Not the what often you see, you know, with the fancy suits. And and um, it, it's 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 made for performance, even though that's that's an amazing thing to do. And it's, it's not easy and it is very hard, but it's still a very different thing. It, you, it's not the real application and the real inside the true kung fu yeah. which you will learn in this school so for those who don't know there's more modern wushu which is really fancy and flashy and yeah basically that versus the traditional stuff which is a bit more applications focused um so joe you're one of the youngest people that i know of to have trained with shifu what are your thoughts on other young people going to train i think that um well I was I just turned 16 when I first came. I trained in another school, this other school when I was 15. I did not have a problem with that. Everybody was super nice and it, you even though you were young like it it's like a good community so you can chill out with 40-year-olds or 30-year-olds or 20-year-olds or 50-year-olds whatever. And the youngest I've seen is also 14 or 15 and and that's really not a problem in in any way. To, to go at that age but if you're like 10 i would not recommend it <laughs> but definitely into, into your teens you know but 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 if you're in your teens you'll be totally fine yeah okay 
Cool. What about some of the older people you've met? What are your thoughts on them and training? <clears throat> Um, well, I've met multiple people over 40, uh, late 40s into 50s. Actually, the oldest person I've encountered who trained Kung Fu in China was like about 70. Uh. A dude from Iceland, actually. Big, beard, cool dude. But in, in Shifu school, the oldest I've seen is uh, early 50s. And that's also fine. Like, um, if you're older and like, you know, like you have pains and stuff, Shifu will respect that not that you you, you you won't respect it in the way that like you can't you you, you you can't do anything but it's not gonna like power stretch you or something like that unless you want it and i've seen many people like in yeah far into the 40s and they train and they do tai chi and shaolin and uh, a little bit of sanda and and it's, it's, it's really fine shifu can kind of like mold the training mm -hmm. at, at, to to where you're at so that that's not a problem at all yeah, I mean, when you talk about molding the training too, a lot of people don't realize how much training changes throughout the year, and especially like throughout the years, as someone like you would know. Um, do you want to give some thoughts on winter training versus summer training so people can be prepared <clears throat> if they're going in a certain season of the year? Yes. Um, my personal favorite is uh, spring and fall. When it's not too hot and not too cold and you can still train outside, that's that's personally my favorite because then you get like the broadest spectrum. But in winter, it's a quite small training hall. So it's usually focused on more technique training. And it's it, it, so it, because also the small place, it's usually not like a, a lot of running or like like a lot of the exercises that, that go a very long way in that sense or like when when it's when a lot of people in summer are, are in many different locations around the school, then it's often not so easy for Shifu to look at everyone at the same time. So, but in winter, like everyone's there, cramped up, so he will always watch you in that sense. When he's there, he'll know everything everyone is doing, so it's also easier that he can see and help you with that. And it's also own techniques that, for example, everyone stands stands around, and then one person does, for example, usually a fourth, sometimes a sixth off the form. For example, three times, and the next person goes, and next person goes, and next person goes, and he will be watching you and, and teaching you the whole time. Compared to summer, when it's often, you know, some people over here, some people over there, then it's not that often. That's that sometimes it's not that condensely taught technique. For example, sometimes like you do it one day of like a lot of it, for example, but another day, it, he's not gonna have time that much to help you. But then for like the next day, it can help you again. And also when it comes to how the power training changes, we do a lot of uh, bunny hops. <laughs> and uh, also in summer when it's hot, we do, for example, the power stretching. It's very limited in winter because of the it's so cold. So you can really just injure your body. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, and again, just the difference between the cold when you're just always cold and your body is cold and your joints and 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 tendons are super cold you're just going to be more tight you got you need more time to warm up compared to summer when you just do like a little bit of running and you're warm and fine and we also do more sparring in summer also because of the heat and how it also depends on injuries for example in the cold when you get a really good kick or like you know you 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 fall wrong on your shoulder or something because of the cold, it's going to be way worse. It's going to take longer to heal compared to the summer. So it's all these reasons that we do more, yeah, more technique than in winter. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when I came, I came in November, which was right before all the cold happened. Um, surprisingly, I would still recommend coming around that time because you go into winter training, like you said, there's not as much sparring, so it's more technical, which I enjoyed. So you work the technique, the body strength, and then by the time summer comes, you're a bit more hardened for the fighting and everything that's gonna come with it, as opposed to if you, well, Shifu doesn't just drop people into fighting right away, he'll obviously gauge your skills. So I don't think you have to worry about that, but for me, I find it was a, it was a good warm up to come in the winter and work on all the technique in the base, and then in the summer, just be able to kind of let loose? I would definitely also recommend that. It's very common for people to come around September, late August, September, early October, and then stay for the year. That's also very common, and that's also a, a very good, good, yeah, good, good way to do it. Because then if you come in summer and you get all the summer training and then you end it in winter, 
you might not be fully satisfied. So I would definitely recommend with ending in the summer or ending by the end of the summer. Mm -hmm. Starting then before winter and going through that in the beginning. Um, since you, you've had more cycles, what would you say is a normal amount of people at the school? Because I've been there with six or seven people, but there's also been times when there's 13 people. I would say an average of six, five, six, an average. Um, but yeah, we'll say say five to eight, average five, five to eight, because yeah. I've also been there with two two people. But that's not that common anymore. Anyway, that that was quite common in the beginning. When I first came, we were three, three people, more or less, for the whole winter. Mm. But um. Yeah, average of seven, say seven. <clears throat> yeah. You're getting a lot of attention from Shifu. It's not a giant class of 20 or 30 people. I, um, you've been to the, you've been to Shaolin Temple in Dongfeng, and uh, you, you can watch these really big classes of 30 people with a Shifu, and there's maybe 50 Shifus with all these classes. You've seen, have you seen that when you were there? Yeah, yeah yes, definitely. And that, that's one of the differences with this school, that it is a small school. And you see, you, you'll get to know Shifu personally by being here because it, it's so small. And for example, this other school I was at, like for long-term students after a while, you know, you, you would get to know the Shifu. But the, the, the three months that I trained there, I, I never really got a good relationship, like not a bad relationship, but like a close relationship with my Shifu because it's just such a big school and you just go to class and then there, there's your Shifu and you go back and the Shifu's, you know, they stay somewhere else. But in this place, you like, you, you, everybody will really get to know each other and then it's way easier for him to really give you the training and mold you into the the Kung Fu characteristics that you have. Yeah. Um, I guess something else most people don't realize is that a lot of people in China don't speak English. And there's a lot of people don't speak English, and so they have translators there. Um. Yes, um, yeah, Shifu will actually speak English with you. Um, it's going to be a little bit hard to understand in the beginning, but you'll get the hang of it in no time. And he's really open to understanding, so you'll you'll he'll, he'll definitely get what he wants to get. Like when he wants to say something, it'll be said compared to another school I was at. Then the Shifu spoke to this translator which knew nothing about wushu like kung fu and then she or sometimes he told you about these techniques and it it, it just doesn't work very well you know and then sometimes it's really funny because i multiple times like the chief you know he's standing there and he's talking and explaining about all these techniques for like you know like 10 minutes and then the translator is like you know you know go do high kicks you know, like to, a 20 second explanation of his like multiple minutes. And you know that he explained all this, but the translator just can't say it. And, and he, multiple times, these translators, they, they were never fluent. They were OK in English. So really not very good. So it's very good that she speaks English. Yeah, we're pretty fortunate. I think Beth was the one who helped teach him English and maybe Kyle. Um. <clears throat> He is kind of like learned on the way, I think, from his years of, of, of practice. Yeah. I don't know the first time he started. I, I, I don't know that. But he always knew how to speak uh, for as long as I've been here anyway. Okay. Okay. Um, on that topic, so some people ask me about learning Mandarin while in China. I studied it on my own, but I still found it pretty hard because our school is kind of isolated up in a mountain unless you go on the weekends and practice your Mandarin, it's kind of, yeah. But I know you did a semester in college. Can you give us a little bit of your feedback on that? Yeah. Um, I would recommend just learning some Chinese in your room and speaking a little bit with the Shifu or speaking a little bit with like the chef or like if sometimes there are Chinese people there you can talk with and in the weekends and you just get like a little online course. But yeah, I, I did take a semester and there are other people, but one other person there, which has done that. And it's it's when you go there anyway, this was like the last thing I did after years of training Kung Fu. So if you go there, Shifu's not going to 
ship you off to some school because it takes a lot of time. It takes at least half your training day. So if you go there for at least a year, like you will not be able to do it Chinese semester. Definitely not. Like, yeah, you, know, you would definitely need your Kung Fu first. It's totally possible, but it's like a 40 minute drive every day in, into town. And then it was like a four hour class of uh yeah chinese and, and it, it's fine but it, it the teachers don't speak english they just talk to you in chinese uh there, there is some english though in in the book but you you would really it will be from chinese to english and so you really need to know english at least before you can try to learn the chinese there but yeah if you're staying for many years then yeah maybe you can do it but it's definitely not something you can just go and do Okay. while being at, at the school then you would for example have to do something else and then you know go to school in china but that's something completely different which is many people who do that mm -hmm. yeah if you're if you're looking to study chinese on your own that's what i would recommend just do it in your room uh dominant Definitely. chinese was pretty cool for me helped me out um so yeah uh what are three things joe that you would recommend people bring to the school i would recommend <clears throat> uh yeah knee supports just like simple knee supports you can just put on just some basic stuff just like the yeah just basic knee supports and a mouth guard because you can borrow gloves and shin guards and everything there but you will not be able to borrow anybody's mouth guard unless they're very nice and that that would be very weird but you never know but yeah i would recommend bringing a mouth guard and a cup yeah all, all three of those are very important, especially the mouth definitely. cup can be very useful. Um, definitely some, well, most people didn't come with a mouth guard or cup, then they had to order it and wait a month. So it's not very yeah. pleasant when you're doing face conditioning and you don't have a mouth guard. So well, and then face conditioning, then it's just getting punched in the face. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, you want a mouth guard for that. And a copy, even, even if you're not going to spar, because there are many techniques which we do while we're still hitting and kicking each other where you would want to have a cup even though you're not sparring because you're doing technique so you definitely want a cup and a mouth guard yeah i can speak to that several times we weren't sparring and i took two or three knees to the to the old you know and i had my cup and i was like oh thank god i had a cup that was a hard knee yep. we weren't even fighting i don't think i've been kicked in that area while fighting actually it's just been accidental through other things yeah um, so Alex spoke last time, he said one of the things you got to do when you come to China is not just do Kung Fu, but you should also travel around. So what are some of your favorite places you've been in China? Well, yeah, well, some of the favorite places, I'm like a nature guy. So I like always like nature just to see like scenery and stuff better than cities. But in China, my favorite place would be actually like in in down by uh, guilin it's really nice like the mountains there definitely recommend to go down there i went to um hong kong multiple times it's 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 not my type of place but it, it, it's all right actually my favorite city is dalian it's a few hour, hours with a bullet train south of Siping. and it's a really nice city actually Mm -hmm. And I also went to Harbin. You can you actually something you should really do is go to the ice festival. It's every winter in Harbin. It's like an hour and a half on the bullet train, like two and a half hours with a slow train, something like that. Definitely worth it. Yeah, and last year we got pretty much everyone from the school went. I think maybe ten people. We all went up there for the weekend, and it was pretty cool. We went in the hostel, saw all the sights. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So you're gonna find out when I came. I wasn't planning on going anywhere traveling especially because i didn't know people but then matt's on my roommate just said hey do you want to go to shanghai I'm like okay let's go to shanghai we only knew each other for a few weeks and just the bonds form really quickly there so even if you're well most of us go by ourselves um but the bonds will form pretty quick so you'll have people to travel with yeah and most of the people that are there are also very interested in traveling so so yeah, that's definitely not going to be a problem. So Joe, uh, what was the best part of the school? The yeah, what part well, of your training. Yeah, um, for me, it was just the, the training, really. Um, how you train 
every part of your body and the constant training like you always feel like you get enough training and and you always like you know you can you can you know you can go out and train and and you know that like tomorrow i'll be better and the day after tomorrow i'll be better next week i'll be better and and you just always you know have enough training time to always improve and the, the spectrum of the training for example we train yeah every part of the body the, the fingers the knuckles uh, the wrists uh, your, your arms, core, legs, feet, balance, uh, stamina, and and also some weights. Not too much powerlifting, and but you also get this. Just in in gung fu, you get this body control. Like this, all these forms you're doing, it's really up and down, and here and there, and down and up, and it's just you activate your whole body, and you can just feel like you just get a lot of body control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's definitely my favorite part. And also, yeah, with the winter and summer, so you'll have the experience of training super hard in minus 35 and also have the experience of training super high, super, super hard in plus 35. So you have like a more than 60 degrees Celsius spectrum of, of training. So you, you really just, if you stay there a full year, your body just gets through like a, like a proper workout <laughs> big yeah. acclimatization for both sides yeah. yeah then not being the best part what's the hardest part the hardest part for me was by training so much and also in the different climates and all the different parts of your body and constantly it's the thing about how it tears down your body your joints your tendons and your muscles on the physical and the internal like your mind and how often, you know, maybe you think that like, yeah, you can just go and like the only thing you have to deal with is just the muscle pain from training, like being sore, but you'll get all these injuries and back pain, knee pain, wrist pain, neck pain, chest pain, foot, all kinds of pains and, and still being, still having to train in that sense with all this pain and with all these injuries. But what you will do and learn to do is still being able to be flexible within your training and still do it. But also, you know, all the pain, it's not just often, it's not just to do these push ups or just do these bunny hops or just do this form. You have to do it with a lot of pain. So it's just a lot of pain. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely yeah. not, uh, you're not going there to relax and have fun. Like you're there to work and to get better. And yeah. something I noticed too is, um, <clears throat> the qigong that we do we do um you know 20 minutes in the morning and evening with some tai chi i noticed that every day i was feeling beat up at the end and thinking to myself there's no way i can wake up and feel okay and then i i, I credit this to the qigong and the chi is that no matter how crappy my body felt at night i would wake up and have this renewed energy and my body would not be anywhere near as sore as it would if back home I did a workout and felt like this and the next morning I can't walk, that kind of thing. Um, do you have that same experience with your Qigong and, and learning that sort of stuff? Definitely. Um, Qigong helps a lot. And that's also the same about traditional stuff. If you train this hard, you need to also focus on the internal, really the internal and, 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 and it's really what drives everything. So having like a strong Qi, like a strong energy in your body is just gonna help everything by far. <clears throat> So doing Qigong every day is definitely recommended. And we do that anyway in the school. So that definitely helps a lot. But even though after a while, it'll still be a lot of pain. But I can just imagine all the pain it would be without this internal stuff. Absolutely. And I've noticed other people wouldn't take it as seriously. And they wouldn't feel the Qi. They're not thinking about it, not concentrated on it. And they wouldn't get the same pacing and results during training. And you could see that they were in like a lot more pain compared to other people who did take it more seriously. Um, yeah. So for yeah. those watching, uh, Joe is a total beast. He's pretty humble, but around the school, he he's really good. He's very technical, very strong. Uh, Joe, you were considering opening up some sort of school teaching out there. Do you want to give us a little information on what you would be covering? Or? Well, I um I want to do some start teaching some classes. To be honest, I'm I'm thinking about 
teaching Shaolin and the Qigong and Tai Chi. And I'm, I'm still kind of looking for, you know, looking for people and what people are interested in because I've never actually had cor courses like this before. So my plan is really to do Tai Chi and Qigong for some and then Shaolin in a different class. Even though they'll, they'll, they both kind of interconnect, but yeah. Okay. And you're in Norway, so if people want to hook up with you, if they're around there, I'll leave uh, details down below, all of Joe's links and everything. And moving on, um, what would you recommend people do to prepare themselves for an experience like this? Stretching, especially <laughs> your legs, a lot of stretching, and leg training, like bunny hops and squats. So. If, if everybody knows what a bunny hop is, if you don't know what a bunny hop is, it's kind of like a jumping squat. So you go down the squat and then you jump up like this. And you go forward and just go as far as you can <clears throat> and then backwards. And and yeah, if you do those two things, stretching and bunny hops and, and like leg training, uh, you'll you'll be quite fine, actually. Yeah, no kidding. With the leg training? It's pretty, especially the bunny hops, don't do a small amount, do a large amount if you're coming, because we would do these things up a hill three times, and then that's like warm up to what everything else you're doing. So get that leg endurance and leg power up, it's really gonna help you. Um, and Joe, you, you've been in and out of the school several times, so you know, when you come back, you don't continue at that same level, you gotta rebuild and start to slowly peak back up. So I found that several times when I would go away for a week or two and just travel and not do anything for my training and I come back and I do the same amount, like my body's still able to do it, but the amount of soreness I had in my legs, like just barely being able to walk for several days, is pretty unpleasant. Um, yeah, stop yeah, it. Yeah. And, um, and also the thing is that every day is leg day. That's just the thing there. Every day is leg day. It's it's some kind of leg training every day. You you really don't get away from training your legs, even though it's even if it's Tai Chi, sometimes even Qi Gong, and you still do these leg things. And and, and Shaolin and Kung Fu, all this stuff. It's it's so much leg training. And then plus that you have these power trainings where you do these bunny hops and all these other exercises, but still it's every day is leg day. Yep. <laughs> that should be the title of the video. Every day is leg day. Yeah. Like that. Um so Joe, we're coming near the end of this. Is there anything else you want to touch on or throw to people, give some thoughts? <clears throat> yeah, well, also about the, um, when you go there, many people have probably said this, it's also about like you will definitely meet a lot of new people. And that's also something I gained a lot from, the difference in in, in people, because most people, you know, they stay at home or something, or, or they, even when, when many people go to other countries, they only stay with like, you know, to go to study, they'll stay with like people from their own country and everything. But you'll definitely meet people from different cultures all over the world and that is very helpful it'll make you grow not in the gung fu but you know in in the, the mind that's a very beneficial thing what i've when i've been in china i've learned a lot that way about people and situations and different points of view and you can also apply this in your kung fu and also how you learn that you have so much to learn from everyone at all times, e even though like you, you you can be there and train gung fu for many years, but sometimes like a new person comes and you can know you can always learn something from that other person, and that's also the thing, thing about having so many different people come and go. Even so, you really learn, and you will, many times you'll really be humbled by itself from from what pe pe other people can do and what you can learn from everyone else. Like uh, like again, I wanted to credit Alex Korn with how he taught me many of my flips. My first backflip was taught by Alex Korn, actually. And I know the student that was there <clears throat> from his parkour experience. So, yeah, you, you always have something to learn. And that's really what I would want to touch on, yeah. Yeah. Well, I definitely learned a few um, cool moves from you, Joe. Um, like that and I, I can hear, yeah. That part wheel. It's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was funny, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I remember takedown that you taught me. It's... Um, yeah, always have some, something to learn. Yeah, and that's the thing, because like so many different martial arts backgrounds come together too, that it's almost like MMA where you get to mix in 
whatever's effective and working. Yeah. Um, absorb what is useful, discard what is useless. There you go. Words of wisdom from Joe. So make sure if you're up in Norway, I highly recommend training with Joe. He is one of the most knowledgeable students of Shifu's. His technique is really good and he's great at sparring. But not only that, he's a believer of the internal sides, the Tai Chi. His forms are really quite amazing if you get a chance to see them. So make sure to check out Joe. Joe, thanks for coming on today. Letting me ask My you pleasure. a few questions, sharing knowledge with uh, everyone else who's looking to go to the school. And uh, if you guys have any questions, just leave me a comment down below. If you have any questions for Joe, feel free to reach out to him. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you in the next one.